Thank you. So, so I, I'd like to, to refocus our attention on caves briefly and uh, and look at one particularly interesting case study uh, in at a place called Gypsum Cave. Um, in the late 19th century, we learned, or at least I learned yesterday, um, that European archaeologists were were looking for evidence that humans had had uh, had interacted with now extinct Pleistocene animals, and they found that evidence here in the Vizier Valley. Um, and we, we we all know all about that. So 30 years later, in the 1920s and early 30s, North American archaeologists were asking essentially the same question regarding the people in the New World. And we we also have a, a, a Pleistocene megafauna that became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. Uh, and the question among American archaeologists in the, in the early 20th century concerned the timing of the initial peopling of the New World and the question of whether or not humans had arrived in the New World prior to the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. And there's, there was no doubt at that time that, that the early, early residents of North America um, had, a, had come from Asia. Uh, and that's still, still, uh, still, still no doubt about that. Uh, and presumably, they came across the the Bering Land Bridge when sea level was low during glacial advances. The Pleistocene sea level dropped 100 meters or more, exposing a huge area called Beringia uh, that was accessible to many animals and and people. Uh, there's now a lot of a lot of discussion about maybe the early arrival early arriving humans actually came along in kayaks along the coast, which which is a different story for a different day. Um, so the, the path that that certainly in 1930, the, the time that I'm interested in right now, um, that everybody accepted was that people had come across the Bering Land Bridge and had then dispersed throughout North America. Uh, the question is, when did they do that? Uh, prior to about 1930, the consensus among most American, most North American archaeologists was that no people were in North America until after the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. Um, Gypsum Cave, the cave I'm going to be talking about this evening, became a focus for testing that hypothesis. We can see where Gypsum Cave is, right in that sort of metaphorical arrow, arrow there. And it's right next to Las Vegas, where I live. Uh, it's just a few miles east of Las Vegas, out on a little mountain range overlooking Lake Mead. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the field. It, it looks much larger in the field. The, the entrance is, is actually much, much tighter. Here you can see in this topographic map um, that the, the lower left shows a bunch of contour lines. That's a, that's a very steep slope that comes down into the cave. And then, and I'll show you a picture of that slope in just a minute. I want, while I have this image up, I want to mention the largest room here. Um, this room called room four is about a thousand square meters. It's a big cave and it's completely dark in there. Um, I've been in there many times. And then there's lots of other rooms. So the entrance goes down this slope here, and then then you drop down about two meters in the dark uh, on a very you know very steep slope, uh, and then there's then there's lots of rooms. It's called Gypsum Cave because it's it's in gypsum deposits. Uh, these are evaporite Permian evaporite deposits um, in between big thick uh, shallow water carbonates, and of course the 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 gypsum being soluble in water just uh, dissolved away over the uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years that the cave was ex exposed. So here's that slope that heads down. This is this is called room two. It's what Harrington called it through the archaeologist. And then this is the this is the, the the descent. So these two people in the view here are right on the precipice of dropping down two meters. Um, with of course you have a flashlight, but it's it's a pretty precipitous drop. And that's relevant because of what kinds of animals could have negotiated that. Certainly not not uh, ungulates like horses and 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 deer or camels, uh, but sloths could, and and we'll get to sloths in just a minute. So uh, before I before I continue on, I want to mention one thing that didn't come up today in any any of the talks regarding uh, caves in in France, and that's the issue, of course, specifically the issue of native native cultural uh, problems. Um, there's a complication for archaeologists working in caves in North and South America and also the Caribbean islands, and that's that the, the caves are often sacred sites for indigenous people. 
Gypsum Cave, for example, is a sacred site for the local Paiute tribe, which is still very much present in southern Nevada, where I live and where the cave is. Uh, no burials have been found in Gypsum Cave, but the Paiute shamans visit the cave, visited the cave, and still do occasionally to obtain their power and learn their songs. And the cave is where their what they call their spirit helpers live. When Gypsum Cave was excavated in 1930, the Paiutes had no political power at all. And uh, they, while they objected to the excavation of their sacred site, uh, their, 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 their protests were completely ignored and the archeologists were permitted to do anything they wanted. Um, that's, that case is, that's a situation not the same anymore. Sensitivity uh, to, American, to Native American culture is now a very big deal in American culture and politics. And so an excavation of a cave that was a sacred a Native American site, I'm sure, would not be allowed today. But that was not an issue in 1930. So here's Mark Mark Harrington, the archaeologist who was in charge of that cave, a very prominent guy who had excavated lots of other sites, especially in the American Southwest. And here he is with his uh, respirator and and uh, carbide uh, lantern on his head. Uh, here's here here he is in camp to give you a little sense of what the camp looked like. So there they were for several months. They took a break in the summer, came back in the fall of of 1930 to to finish up. The woman in the with the typewriter in the cave is is named Bertha Parker. Her nickname was Birdie. She becomes a really important person in my story, but I don't have time to talk about her very much. I'll mention her at the very beginning, at the very end of my talk. Um, she she was a a Seneca Indian. Um, from, from New York State, the Seneca people um, were a matrilineal culture that traced their ancestry through the mother's line. Uh, really interesting person who has her own story to tell that I just don't have time to get into except a brief comment in a few minutes. These, these slides just show you how challenging this excavation had to be. Not only was there this two meter drop at the beginning, um, but there was lots of, of uh, topographic relief within the cave uh, and so they couldn't remove, they couldn't take material out of the cave and screen it, for example, outside. They had to, whatever they did with the material, they had to basically move, dig up portions of the cave, move it to one side, backfill, and so on. So it was a, a, a relatively difficult excavation. Uh, here, here they are moving some big rock for some reason up a slope. Um, the, most of the excavators were Native Americans, but none of them were Paiute, the local tribe. They came from Arizona and California. And that was typical of Harrington, the archaeologist. He typically hired Native American crew members. The, the guy named Jim Thurston uh, in the middle there, I'll get back to him in just a minute. Um, so he, Harrington published the results of his study in 1933 in a monograph. And uh, it, it's become a, a very prominent monograph in the history of, of North American uh, archaeology. One of the things that he identified in that particular monograph is something called the Gypsum Cave Point. Which is which is a a, a typical per, particular st st style of a projectile point uh, that you can see there. Um, there's no paleontology in this in this report. And when I came to the University of Nevada 40 some years ago, and I was new to the area and just interested in the local geology and paleontology, I bought a copy of Harrington's book and read it, and I thought that's all great, but where's the description of the bones? Uh, and it, turned out the description of the bones were going to be done by this guy. This is a vertebrate paleontologist named Jim Thurston, who, who was from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, and it, it, he has his own interesting story as well. Um, he was hired uh, by the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Um, Chester Stock was the prominent paleontologist there who hired Jim Thurston to work at the Gypsum Cave site because Harrington, the, the archeologist, had no experience with non-human vertebrates. And so he needed a paleontologist and uh, Thurston happened to be in the right place at the right time. And and he was the guy. Um, he was also a, a skilled artist. So this is one of Thurston's sketches of the, of some of the prominent animals that they had excavated way in the back there um, are, are bighorn sheep or an extant species, which is still still quite common in southern Nevada area. Um, and then he shows two species of camels, cam camelids, members of the camel family. This one here is called uh, Camelops, which is a very prominent North American camel genus. This one here is Hemiokinia, which is a smaller, more, more uh, slender camel. And then he's got some horses in the background. And this is a ground sloth. Uh, this is Nothrotheriops. 
Uh, ground sloths are unique to the new world, so you don't see any ground sloths in caves in, in uh, Les Aizis. Uh, I'll talk more about ground sloths in, in just a minute because they're an interesting part of this whole story. Um, so Thurston would have been the guy who would have described this fauna had he been able to. Tragically, uh, at the end, shortly after the whole project ended in early 1931, he died at the age of 27. Um, I got a copy of his birth certificate, which with death certificate rather, uh, which said he died of congestive heart failure, which I don't believe for a minute. And, I've, and he was a healthy guy. Uh, it was sort of mysterious why he died. And, and we still don't know, don't know the reason for that. Um, because the, the vertebrate taxa were not properly described, uh, I got one of my grad students to work with me on that. And, and I'm not going to dwell on, on the detailed paleontology here. Um, but anyway, you can see that the different taxa, the, this, these are minimum number of individuals, which is a kind of a standard thing that, that we do at paleontological sites. There was a minimum in how many left humeri are there, for example. Um, and so there are six, six, a minimum of six sloths and five horses and, and so on, some, some foxes and, and, and bighorn sheep and deer. Um, but the ground sloths are especially important. So, you, so the extinct species are basically are horse, camels, and, and ground sloths. Um, we, get, we, we get lots of dung in these caves. Um, these, are, these are huge boluses of dung that the, that the sloths apparently hung out in these caves quite often. We don't know what they were. This, uh, ground sloths, of course, are extinct members of the, of the Xenarthrin order. They have living relatives in, in Brazil and Costa Rica and so on. The tree sloths, which are quite different. I mean, they're certainly related, but, but we don't learn a lot about the natural history of, of ground sloths by studying tree sloths. So they're an interesting extinct group. Um, here's Nothertheria opshastensis, the Shasta ground sloth is the one that, that we find uh, the bones and dung of in, in Gypsum Cave. Um, Gypsum Cave is famous for, for, for paleontological reasons in addition to the, the 1930 excavation. For example, the first DNA that was ever recovered from any fossil of, of any kind came from ground sloth dung from Gypsum Cave. There was a problem when you try to get DNA out of fossil bone or teeth or, or, or dung uh, prior to 1998 when this paper was published, uh, you just couldn't do it because the, there was chemical problems uh, which they were able to finally solve with the, with the ground sloth dung from Gypsum Cave using a polymerase chain reaction uh, to, to uh, amplify the DNA. P PCR, of course, has become a household name since COVID uh, back in 1998 was a pretty obscure uh, technique. So it's known for that reason. And also here, for example, is an extinct species of horse that was, that was identified from uh, material from Gypsum Cave that, that they were able to get DNA from. So it's well known. It's a well-known cave in North American paleontology and archaeology. Back to Harrington. So Harrington, again, was he, he, contrary to most of his North American archaeological colleagues, strongly suspected that humans had been early arrivals in North America rather than late arrivals as most of the archaeologists thought. And he wanted Gypsum Cave to be the place that he documented that. So he was he was obsessed, maybe a little bit too strong a term, but he had strong motivations to find evidence that humans were, were in Gypsum Cave prior to the extinction of at least the ground sloths. And here's one of his one of the evident one sketch in his publication 1933 publication that that shows a, a cross section of a trench that had been dug in the cave and what you see here uh what he shows is an unbroken layer of sloth dung and then underneath that is our burnt sticks which he interpreted to be a hearth and based on this on the the, the this biostratigraphy that we we heard about this morning uh anyone could conclude that of course, the, the, the hearth, if that's really what it is, uh, was there prior to the ground sloth dung being deposited. Uh, and, and so that was, that was suggestive, but then he found another exposure that was even better. And so this one shows, uh, so this is a, a meter there, three feet. And so here, here is uh, some cribbing. Um, here is a layer with, 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 uh, oops, with darts. And then this is a layer that has sloth dung and hair in it. And well below that, half a meter or so below this sloth dung and hair layer are painted dart shafts, absolutely unequivocally human artifacts. And so when he found that, he was absolutely certain that he had 
found unconvertible uh, evidence that humans had li had lived in North America, specifically in the in the area of Gypsum Cave, prior to the extinction of the ground sloths. Um, the problem, and, th and that, that held up for 25, 30 years until radiocarbon dating came along. And then the radiocarbon dates in the, in the 1960s did not support that stratigraphy. Um, here, you, here you see, so the sloth dung turned out to be late Pleistocene, 11,700, uh, and the burnt sticks were, were late Holocene, 2,400, much, much younger. So you have young, sti young sticks uh, below old sloth dung. And then furthermore, this other site with the painted dart shafts, the date painted dart shafts are, you know, they're made out of wood, so easily datable, 2,900 late Holocene age. And again, the sloth dung is, is late Pleistocene. So the, the radiocarbon dating does not support his interpretations. And that's a, that was a problem. Um, well, how can, and we still, to this day, there's no good explanation of that. Nobody and people have written about Gypsum Cave and we don't really understand that. Here's just one suggestion of how that could be. I mean, one suggestion could be that that Harrington was, uh, you know, cooking the books a little, and I, and I don't want to accuse him of that. But I suppose that fraud is one possibility that that uh, that could be entertained. Another possibility is this cute little guy. This is Neotoma wood rat, also called pack rats, which are common in the Southwest. So these are little guys that run around at night collecting seeds and other things, and they bring all kinds of things into their into their nests. Um, sometimes car keys of campers and and things like that, uh, and they they make a nest that looks like this called a wood rat mitten. Much of what we know about the the climate change in especially southwestern North America uh, over the last several thousand years comes from the study of wood rat middens because we can get a radiocarbon date, uh, a beautiful radiocarbon date, and we can get pollen grains and and seeds and pine needles and you know, various kinds of plant remains and say, well, okay, the, we know what kinds of plants lived at this site uh, at such and such a date. So they're very, there's, there's a rich literature on, on neotoma. Um, wood rats, and they also burrow. They collect things and they burrow. And so one idea might be that wood rats uh, burrowed in the cave. They picked up some of Harrington's uh, painted dart shafts, for example, and, and carried them deep in the cave. And, basically bioturbated the, the floor of the cave to the point where the stratigraphy is completely messed up. So that's a possibility. Um, this, whole, I, 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 this whole story of Gypsum Cave has really captured my interest, not only because of the science, but also I think it's a story that can be communicated to the general public. There's so many different stories I didn't, I didn't mention, but I will right now, that Jim Thurston, the Canadian paleontologist, fell in love with, with Bertie, um, the, the young Indian girl, they ended up getting married. Thurston, tra tragically, as I, as I mentioned, uh, died shortly after they got married. So there's a lot of tragedy involved. Um, Harrington's, you know, passionately trying to prove his, his pet hypothesis that humans were here in North America prior to the extinction of the, of the megafauna and, and so on. There we have the, the Paiute problem. I didn't mention, and I don't think that the Paiutes actually, I, maybe I did mention, the Paiutes protested. They, they did not want their sacred site excavated um, by all these archaeologists. Um, that, was, that was their sacred site. They protested, but, but as, I, as I mentioned, I guess, they had no political power. Um, so there's this kind of tension between the Native American crew members from different tribes and the Paiutes uh, from the local tribe. So what, what you see on the screen here is is a is a play a, the is the name of a play um, that I'm working on um, to present the story to the general public and and to 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 explore how science works and how sometimes you have problems and and there's romance and death and so on involved. I have two sons who are very musically talented, which I am not, but my two sons are working with me on the music. Uh, we have a we have a we have the book and lyrics, but we the music has a long way to go. So I'm hoping maybe a year from now we can actually start doing performances of, of this story of Gypsum Cave. So thanks so much for staying late and uh, paying attention. Thank you for telling us this wonderful story and we wait for the performance next year. <laughs> and the movie, yes. Um, look, it is 6.30. Uh, I, I imagine you're all very tired, but do you want that we take five minutes for one or two questions still?
for the two last. If there is an urgent question, there is one. You have an urgent question. And also to, to Renee. Thank you for a wonderful story. Uh, you said the C C14 datings were from the early 60s. Uh, well, at that time they needed a lot of material to get one date. And now they can make uh, with AMS uh, a date from a single grain. So how is the present situation? Well, that's a good question. And those those materials, the dung and the and the archaeological artifacts, as far as I know, have not been redated. And and, and that wouldn't be a bad thing to do to do an AMS date on some of that material. The, we have dated other dung and other sloth bones and so on. None of it comes out to be anything later than late Pleistocene. So I don't think the results are going to be any different. Uh, oh, also, I should say that my grad student and I, who studied the, the vertebrate paleontology, found absolutely no evidence of human interaction with those bones. Harrington, in his monograph in 1933, shows some marks on some of the sloth bones, which he interpreted to be cut marks. We did scanning electron microscopy. They're, they're kind of grooved uh, rodent rodent marks and by our interpretation. And there was other evidence that, that Harrington uh, marshaled in support of his hypothesis. When we did a detailed study of the bones, we couldn't find any evidence of any human interaction with the bones. So I, th I think the dates would hold up, but your, your suggestion is a good one about AMS dating. Thank you. So the, uh, at least in this region, human cannot be taken responsible for the extinction of animals. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a whole different story. That's a different story. <laughs> what you heard Claudine say, and, and I, that's a story for another day, whether or not the extinction was caused by the humans. Th right, that we know, we know in North America, to, to, to not let that dangle too long, we know in North America that there definitely were humans there prior to the extinction of the megafauna. I personally strongly suspect that humans played a big role Gypsum Cave, though, is not one of the places that demonstrates that, but there are plenty of other sites that do. So thank you, Claudine, for mentioning that. <laughs> okay.